the, the results in version just just for me oh, to okay. share. Oh, okay, sure. Well, Bernard, that could be. Uh, yes, like I mean, probably tomorrow it will be ready, and as soon as I have it, I will send you the link with the recording. Yeah, yeah, that will be helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to screen it before it goes public. Okay, well, I think it's it's time to begin. <clears throat> uh, good evening, I'd like to welcome everyone to our seminar. We are extremely pleased to have as our speaker tonight, Alexei Makarin. Uh, most of the people know Alexei quite well. He was a member of our team, a faculty member of the Institute for Institutional Studies. Uh, Alexei received his bachelor from the High School of Economics and then continued his education at Northwestern where he got his PhD from. Presently, he is professor of uh, Einaudi Institute for Economic and Finance in Italy, Rome. Alexei does <laughs> uh, development, uh, political economy and applied micro. And tonight his topic is affinity, trust and information. Alexei. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for uh, being here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is all, always a pleasure for me to present at my alma mater, the HSC, but especially uh, uh, an honor to present at the Center of Institutional Studies, the place where I started my career and without which I probably wouldn't have gone on this academic path. And uh, I'm very happy uh, to talk about our new paper titled Affinity Trust Information. This paper is joined with Luigi Guiza, um, we are both from the now Institute for Economics and Finance in Rome. So let me give you uh, some big picture motivation for this project. Um, so as has been well documented in the literature, trust is very important for economic development. Higher trustworthiness and trust can lead to greater levels of economic exchange and prosperity. By now, this is a pretty much a consensus in the literature. Um, so I will not even discuss that. But given that trust is so important, the question is, where does it come from? And there are uh, several ways in which trust can be built. It can be built through repeated interactions. So if you know that you are going to deal with someone frequently um, in the future, you won't have as much incentive to cheat with, on that person. That way, trust can be formed. Another way, trust can be formed through uh, shared social connections. Uh, if there is someone who can vouch for another person, that can help as well. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, various ways in which uh, trust can be formed uh, uh, if there is some information available. But the big question is, where does trust come from when you don't know the person at all and when no history of prior behavior uh, is, a, is available? Uh, okay, so and the core idea of this project is that in situations in which you do not know the person and you have no information, uh, no other information about the person, people tend to trust those who are more similar to themselves along some dimensions. So in other words, you tend to trust those with whom you feel greater affinity. So that's uh, the claim. Uh, and uh, there is quite already, uh, there's already quite a robust body of evidence that suggests that affinity indeed matters for average levels of trust, both in lab, lab experiments and observational data. So uh, uh, Glazer et al. Uh, in their 2000 QGE paper showed that in randomized pairs in lab experiments, when people play trust games, uh, and you know, they're randomly assigned to each other, they tend to trust their opponents more if they're from, of the same race or nationality. So similarly, uh, De Bruyne actually takes it a step further and suggests that when your hypothetical opponent shares facial resemblance uh, with you, this also increases <laughs> your, trust, uh, uh, your trust toward the opponent when you play a trust game. So uh, you're matched uh, randomly and then uh, she manipulated uh, the facial features of the opponent uh, as uh, shown on the screen. And then, of course, the paper by Luigi Guizzo uh, and, and co-authors in their uh, 2009 QG paper uh, shows that countries with greater genetic similarity seem to trust each other more. Uh, of course, that was not the main uh, point of their paper, but that's one of the results. So what we do in this paper is that we generalize this idea away from these specific dimensions uh, of affinity to a broader concept of affinity that encompasses 
all of these features, uh, all of these specific uh, specific dimensions, and then based on this on some features of the data that we that I will show you just on the next slide, we propose a simple theoretical framework that explains them, and then with uh, this framework actually yields some predictions uh, that we then test with the data. So that's uh, the uh, the plan for this paper. Uh, so what are the features of the data that we find striking and which motivate the theoretical framework? So on these slides, you can see a relationship between trust beliefs and affinity that we observe between pairs of individuals in our data set. And I will later talk about which specific data set this is. Uh, so you know, ignore that for now. Just uh, think about these as pairs of individuals, and then uh, they have trust beliefs and affinity between them. Uh, uh, measured in some way. So what you can see here is that, uh, uh, first of all, in line with the pre previous findings, we observe a strong positive relationship between trust and affinity. So uh, 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 it is very robust and uh, quite uh, quite linear. So uh, then uh, another thing that you notice here is that there are almost no pairs of people for whom affinity is low, uh, or sorry, for whom affinity is high, but trust is very low. So you can see that in the right down corner here, there are almost no observations. So in contrast, there are quite a few pairs for whom affinity is low, but trust is very high. So if you, believe, if you thought that, you know, probably trust and affinity would measure the same underlying component, or maybe like how, how much you like the person, then you would, you would probably expect just a straight line without any dispersion. So instead here, you see a quite a steady relationship between the dispersion of trust beliefs and, and affinity. So dispersion of trust beliefs is very high when affinity is low, and dispersion of trust beliefs is low when affinity is high. So we find this very striking. Um, and it got us thinking about this issue more seriously and what could potentially rationalize this. So that's how, basically, uh, that's where the motivation for the project came in, uh, in, in the first place. So our framework uh, would be able to rationalize this pattern uh, uh, the, the one framework, sorry, uh, one framework that we have in mind that would be able to rationalize this pattern is that affinity creates some sort of blind trust, uh, uh, meaning that high affinity gives you a very high prior on the person's uh, trustworthiness. And if affinity is very high, then other signals that you receive about uh, the person will get heavily discounted. And then if affinity is low, then you have to rely on other signals, which are noisy. And so on average, your trust beliefs would be about five out of 10. So exactly on the, on kind of on the, uh, on the average, uh, uh, meaning that probably whatever other signals that you rely on, on are very noisy. So that's the intuition uh, behind, uh, uh, behind the framework that we are thinking about. Uh, so we develop it in a simple trust game model. So we build this model. Uh, so I'll not, I, I can go into the details if you're interested, but uh, on this slide, I will just give you the intuition. And then if, if you're interested, I can go into details, um, into the structure of the model, but we think that it's relatively straightforward. So, um, so let's see. So, uh, so we build this model under one core assumption from which everything falls, falls, falls quite naturally. So we are being very transparent here. So this assumption is that affinity raises the cost for the counterpart to cheat on you. And uh, you can rationalize this uh, assumption potentially in various ways, but the way we think about this is that uh, it may potentially arise for evolutionary and behavioral reasons. So um, one way to think about this is that in nature, animals of a given species typically do not uh, uh, prey on other animals of the same species. Uh, so there is this Latin quote, this is actually in Italian, but there is a Latin version as well. Do not, dogs do not eat dogs. Uh, so that's uh, sort of what we're thinking about here. Uh, and going, coming back to humanity, uh, there, is a reason, there is reason to believe that we are wired to protect the people who are similar to us uh, and uh, and so we could be potentially incurring additional psychological costs from cheating on people who are closer to us along some dimensions. Alexei, so, leave, so yes. may, yeah, may I just, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, ask a question. So which kind of uh, affinity are you talking about exactly? Uh, how do you measure affinity? So uh, so we'll measure affinity in two ways. So first is just a, a survey question, <laughs> how much affinity do you feel to the person? But the second way uh, is just 
similarity based on the observable characteristics. So, in, uh, we will use uh, two data sets. I will introduce them in the two, in, in the next on the next slide. And the first data set will uh, have pairs of individuals. Uh, we will have a survey uh, measure for uh, for affinity, but also we will have similarity of these people uh, based on their observable characteristics, such as their you know height, their you know their uh, eye color, and so forth, their education, their um, you know the region where they came from. So yeah, similarity asking, based on just yeah, general asking, similarity. That's the idea. Yeah, I'm asking because I can imagine the different dimensions of, you know, affinity may generate different incentives to trust. One thing is gender. For Gender can also be affinity, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, height is something quite different. So, for example, I mean, I can understand if I tend to trust more people who are of the same race, for example, as myself, or the same kind of come from the same village or something like this. But uh, the same height is something quite different. So I don't uh, feel a strong relation of why should I trust more people who are as tall as myself. <laughs> I understand. Good point, yes. but <laughs> if I may, this is already a discussion. Let's, for the time okay. being, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, restrain communication to questions. And then, of course, after the presentation is over, we'll discuss at length. Thanks very much for bringing this up, Sergey. I no, I think that is fair, that is a fair uh, uh, critique potentially. It's just here we uh, we take a very general stance on affinity. So that's part of what we have, what we the way we see the paper. We take we just generalize affinity to <laughs> to the, to the most possible levels, and so we think that it's because of the psychological uh, and behavioral mechanisms. Um, the mechanism will be the same. Uh, of course, that's that's potentially subject to uh, to some caveats. So we can, yeah, we can discuss that later, later for sure. So, and I think the way uh, uh, Sergey was uh, thinking about this was probably that some of the uh, some of, some of the affinity uh, measures can be associated with information it's, uh, themselves. So, for example, if you, if you have the same uh, race or, or from the same village, then probably you have information about uh, who you're talking, who who you're friends with, and so forth, uh, who you are. In here, we're thinking about a situation in which you do not know anything about the person. You just meet them for the first time, and uh, like, what's your, what is your decision of whether to trust a person or not? So that's that's the idea that we have in mind. Uh, okay, so then, uh, uh, where was I? Okay, so uh, from this assumption, if you believe this assumption, we can uh, uh, naturally get several predictions. So the first prediction that we get is uh, that uh, affinity raises partner's trustworthiness uh, uh, and this increases trust. So why, uh, why in our framework this, uh, it would have, why our framework would have this effect? It is precisely because you know that uh, if, if affinity is high, if the person is very similar to you, then you know that that person is unlikely to cheat on you because of this additional psychological cost. And because of that, uh, you tend to trust that person more. So on average, trust should go up. And this is consistent with uh, the findings uh, that I just documented in the literature. So then uh, this simple framework also gives rise to a few other predictions. So this one is crucial for us uh, and sort of motivated the construction of this framework in the first place. Uh, so the prediction is that affinity reduces the reliance on noisy signals which means that variance in trust beliefs goes down. And again, this is because affinity is the prior. So when affinity is low, uh, you tend to rely on noisy signals, which blows up uh, uh, the uh, variance of trust. So why is this prediction coming out of the model? It is because if you face a more similar opponent, you know that he or she would be less likely to cheat on you. This also means that whatever other signals you receive, they will probably have less weight. So that's uh, the uh, basic idea, basic intuition. On the other hand, if your affinity is low, then you do not know what the person is going to do. And so you have to rely on uh, noisy signals to help you understand this. And finally, uh, uh, you also get this third prediction, which we will also try to test. It is that uh, uh, high affinity may reduce the need for information acquisition. So the argument is again, very similar to the one that I just produced. If your affinity is very low, then you do not know uh, whether the person will behave well or not. And so for that reason, you 
need to acquire additional information and uh, additional signals. Um, and so uh, at the same time, if affinity is high, then you do not know and do not need to do that as much. So, and one potential implication of that is that uh, imagine a situation in which there is a very broad shock to trustworthiness in the, in the population uh, and uh, potentially you need to uh, acquire uh, uh, signals uh, to, uh, you know, to see uh, whether trustworthiness of a person went down or not. In the situation, uh, low affinity players will update their information, their information about trustworthiness very quickly, but at the same time, the high affinity uh, pairs uh, trust, uh, uh, trust beliefs will not update as much. Uh, so that's another prediction that we have. So that's, this is the framework that we have in mind. So we wanted to stress that the first prediction here is, has been already documented in the literature, so it is not novel, but the other two uh, are uh, novel and have not been studied in the literature. Uh, uh, also, you may think about this, uh, just the way we derived, uh, the way we think about this first prediction as kind of a generalization of the uh, of the existing uh, theoretical uh, theoretical mechanisms that people have in mind. And yeah, if you're interested, I can go into details. But because the paper is uh, also heavy in the physics, <laughs> I'll just skip that. Uh, and maybe potentially we can go back to that uh, later during the discussion or something like that. So in this paper, we are going to rely on two data sets. So the first one is uh, uh, the survey of entrepreneurs of about uh, 2,300 Italian firms randomly drawn from the population of uh, small to medium uh, enterprises. Uh, so these were in-person interviews uh, that typically lasted for about one hour. So the interviews were conducted during the financial crisis, which is very helpful to us. And I'll uh, tell, tell you later why. The survey uh, collected detailed information about both interviewers and entrepreneurs, including their uh, physical traits, such as height and eye color and so forth, as already mentioned. Importantly, at the, at the end of the interview, interviewer reveals trust and affinity toward the entrepreneur by answering these two questions that you can see on the screen. So the first one is, uh, uh, you know, how much do you think the person is, uh, is trustworthy? And the second one, how much affinity uh, do you have with the person you Again, uh, you might think that these are uh, you know, naturally correlated because they uh, sort of measure the same thing. But again, if you, if you believe that, uh, and if that were true, then we would just observe a straight line, uh, uh, just 100% correlation uh, without any uh, change in variance. So the fact that we observe this uh, change in variance sort of suggests that uh, these questions are quite, uh, 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 measuring different things. Also, uh, even for the uh, uh, for the linear relationship, we'll be able to uh, use this exogenous similarity, and this exogenous, uh, more exogenous characteristics such as their height and so forth, to sort of instrument for uh, the affinity level, and that uh, that way we can measure a better. We have a, we can have a better measure of the linear relationship between uh, trust and affinity. So that's I'm already sort of anticipating your uh, potential reactions here. So then the second uh, data set that we will mostly use to check the external validity of uh, our findings in the first data set is the Eurobarometer survey from 1970 until uh, 1996. So probably many of you know this data set. It's a representative uh, survey of adult population in the European Union countries. And one of the questions that is important uh, in this survey is trust of citizens of one country towards uh, citizens of other countries within the European Union, but also abroad. And then from the Wiese et al. paper, we can also get the measures of genetic and cultural distance between the two countries, uh, which we will use uh, as measures of affinity. Okay, so let me show you the results that we are getting. Uh, so this is the picture that you saw just a few slides ago, but now you better understand the data set where this is coming from. So here we plot trust beliefs uh, toward in, of <laughs> interviewers toward entrepreneurs and affinity of interviewers uh, uh, toward entrepreneurs or between them. So uh, later, later on, I can actually show you that this affinity uh, seems to be a quite symmetric measure uh, between the two people. So you can see, uh, as I already mentioned, there is a strong positive association between trust and affinity. Um, 
but there is also a visible decline in dispersion of trust beliefs as affinity goes up. And this is consistent with our framework. Uh, when affinity is low, trust beliefs are noisy, but when affinity is high, trust is, very, is always high uh, with uh, low, low dispersion. Uh, so this is the same uh, picture, but here we plot the average trust beliefs and their standard deviation based on the affinity levels. You know, again, the average trust goes up quite steadily and linearly uh, uh, with affinity, but the standard deviation of trust and, and beliefs uh, sort of behaves as a mirror image of the average. Uh, so it goes down also quite steadily and linearly. So this is the same result, but in the regression form. So one of the advantages of showing uh, the results this way is that we can now control for the interviewer fix effects uh, to make sure that our results are not driven by specific interviewers who may uh, like or trust people in general. So you may imagine that our results before that were just uh, you know, uh, occurring for that reason. And uh, as you can see, adding the interview fix effect in the regression uh, produces the same results uh, on the association between affinity and trust. Uh, and uh, uh, regression, strange deviation of trust and affinity, you know, yields this negative relationship, of course, regressive strange deviation on, of, of trust and affinity is a bit problematic. So uh, so here, what we do is just, uh, it's basically a regression of 10 points with weighted uh, uh, by, of strange deviation of trust by affinity, but then we, we're, when we weight, but then we weight the observations by the number of uh, pairs in each, uh, at, at each affinity class. So of course, this is a relatively problematic regression. Uh, we, uh, we also, uh, use an uh, interquartile regression to sort of assuage, assuage that concern. Uh, and in that interquartile regression, we track how the interquartile range of uh, trust depends on affinity level. And again, you, you, you observe this negative relationship. Uh, again, these results uh, show the same picture uh, independent of what we do, just because the relationships are so, like were such stark in this uh, two figures that I showed you before, it sort of doesn't really matter what we, how, how exactly we measure that um, in regression forms. Mm -hmm. So then one question that you might have is how much these results generalize to other settings. So for this reason, the Eurobarometer data is very helpful. So in this table, you can see that both relationships between average trust and strange deviation of trust uh, uh, and affinity hold in this data set as well. So trust between nations within the European Union is positively uh, associated with uh, their uh, genetic and religious similarity and the principal component of these two measures, of course. Uh, and at the same time, the standard deviation of trust beliefs is negatively associated with these measures of affinity. Uh, uh, and uh, this is very consistent with what we uh, observed uh, in the previous data. So, and again, he, uh, here actually standard deviation of trust is measured in, in, the, in, the right, in the right way, right? Because in each country, there was a survey, and in each country, there was some, you know, a thousand of respondents. And so the standard deviation of trust is measured uh, among this 1,000 uh, respondents in the, in the particular survey way from the particular country. So this is actually a, a better way of uh, measuring standard deviation of trust relative to the one that I just showed you before. And uh, uh, here, actually, these first two columns are sort of replicating. Uh, the Guiza et al. Uh, results, but uh, maybe standardizing this, uh, this uh, similarity uh, indices. Um, but the third, the results in the third and the fourth column are novel and have not been documented before. Uh, uh, you know, this is one of the potential contributions of the paper as well. Uh, and know that, of course, uh, these results hold even after encountering country in, uh, for country and year fixed effects and clustering the standard errors at the uh, country player level. So there is a tiny disconnect, uh, probably as Sergey already anticipated with, the, with his question. Uh, there is a tiny disconnect between the two sets of results. In the first set of results, we use the survey-based measure of affinity, but in the Eurobarometer, we use genetic and cultural measures, which are arguably more exogenous and fixed in time. Uh, and so how do we uh, measure, how, does this, how do these measures of affinity relate to each other? So that's the question. So here we regress, we go back to our, our first data set, and now we regress the survey-based measure of affinity on, um, uh, on the measures of uh, sort of objective similarity between interviewers and entrepreneurs based on their observable characteristics, uh, such as their you know, say, same eye color, same hair color, same hair, uh, same sex, and so forth. So you can see that although 
you know, all the individually, each measure may not perfectly predict very, uh, the survey measure very well. Some measures do. Actually, uh, the high distance <laughs> is significant. <laughs> so in contrast to, so, uh, in contrast to uh, probably what you might expect. Uh, uh, and, and then, of course, we can uh, maybe the, each of these relationships uh, do not uh, uh, explain that much variance in affinity. But then, of course, when you uh, construct a principal component out of that, this relationship is uh, quite uh, um, quite strong. So then we can also uh, we can also use this uh, the these measures of uh, affinity interacted with each other uh, as uh, as a set of IVs uh, that we can uh, use in the last IV framework. And when we do that, actually. The uh, so I can tell you more about this, but uh, what's important is that this relationship, this positive relationship between uh, uh, the um, uh, survey-based measure of uh, of uh, uh, trust and affinity is is still there even when we instrument uh, the survey-based measure with or affinity with this uh, kind of uh, IV uh, with these instruments based on the objective measures of similarity between interviewers and interviewers. Okay, so now we would like to test this final prediction that affinity would lead to less accrual of information, uh, which would then lead to slower updating of trust after negative shocks. So this prediction is a bit hard to test, um, but we offer some results which we believe are strongly consistent with this argument. So uh, what we do here is that we use a sudden economic decline as a shock to uh, trust and trustworthiness uh, in the population. So why do we think this is a good idea? The basic argument is that during economic crisis, people are more likely to take selfish actions and uh, that hurt others. And as a result, general trust, uh, uh, generalized trust may decline. So there's also quite a few recent pieces of evidence that show that recessions cause distrust. So for, of course, uh, the paper that you might know already, uh, already is this paper by Maxim Ananyev and Sergey Guryev in Economic Journal. So in addition, our survey of entrepreneurs is actually close to ideal for testing this hypothesis because it took place during the financial crisis. So again, it started in October 2008 and ended in June 2009. Actually, it, it was unrelated. Uh, the reason why the survey was collected at the time was unrelated to the financial crisis itself. It just so happened to be the case. And then uh, uh, also the survey spans multiple Italian regions, which means that we can use geographic uh, variation in exposure to the crisis as a shock to trust uh, in different into your entrepreneur pairs. And then we can, uh, uh, then we also have entrepreneurs on the other side of the interview, which are typically the ones for whom trust declines the most during the uh, economic crisis, but especially the financial crisis uh, um, of 2008. So this, uh, in this figure, you can actually see that indeed the average trust in the entrepreneur survey declined over the course of just a couple of months. So it declined by about 23% uh, of percent deviation, which is, a, a, which is arguably a very big decline for such a short uh, period of time. You can also obtain the same results by uh, controlling for interview fixed effects, uh, which I will show you just in the next slide. But, but important for us, this drop in average trust was bigger for pairs uh, of people uh, who had low affinity uh, to each other. So if you separate uh, the pairs uh, of interviewers and entrepreneurs into high and low affinity pairs, you will see that the decline is concentrated among the low affinity pairs. So this is consistent with our idea that uh, that uh, during, uh, uh, that according to our framework, during broad shocks to trustworthiness, uh, this updating of trust occurs much more in low affinity pairs than in high affinity pairs. So what we do next is we, uh, uh, oh, actually I forgot to say, to say that, uh, you know, here one potential reason might be that Trust goes down, but also affinity goes down. So that, that could be uh, that could be going on potentially. So actually, uh, in our case, on average, this was, this was not happening. So on average, uh, in, if you include uh, interview fixed effects, trust was going down, but affinity was not. So actually, uh, that sort of reassures us that uh, uh, these results are not driven by the simultaneous declines in both uh, measures. So then on, uh, what we do next is we want to explore the geographic variation in economic decline in different regions of Italy. So we would like to see if the decline in trust was bigger in regions with a great economic decline 
and uh, uh, you know, whether this decline in trust was uh, differential uh, by affinity levels as well. So for this, we calculate the decline in employment across Italian regions, which is displayed on this map. I can tell you more about how exactly we do the calculations, but we try to account for seasonality uh, and for previous trends in employment in the regression specification. So these measures are already net of uh, uh, potential pre-trends and net of potential seasonality um, uh, that could be going on across regions. So you can see that in general, the drop in employment was relatively heterogeneous across Italy. So also you can see that it's not just north versus south, there is some heterogeneity across, uh, even in the north, there are some regions where the decline was uh, bigger and even in the south, there are some regions in which uh, decline was not as big. So then one thing that we could do is we could see if the decline in, in trust toward entrepreneurs was bigger in areas, in areas which suffered a bigger drop in employment. And uh, from this regression, you can see that this is indeed the case. So the results in the first row of this table, uh, when, when we regress trust uh, in this pairs interviewer entrepreneur pairs on drop in regional employment affinity and the interaction between the two, uh, including or not including uh, quarter interviewer fixed effects, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what you can see from the first row is that indeed uh, in uh, in areas with a bigger decline in employment, trust went down more. So this is in line with the previous literature that economic that suggests that economic crisis uh, uh, predict uh, present a negative shock to trust, including uh, with a paper by uh, Maxim and uh, Sergey. Uh, so uh, a one uh, the magnitude is also not not trivial. So one uh, percentage point greater decline in, in regional employment is associated with a zero point six to 0.9 uh, uh, point decline in trust level. And remember that uh, the trust was varying from zero to 10. So you can also uh, uh, see that this drop in trust was bigger in pairs of low affinity. So this interaction is uh, positive. Uh, so the, the higher the affinity, the, the lower was the, the decline in trust. Also, you can, you, can, you can split the sample into high and low affinity pairs. And you can see that uh, when we do that, uh, the low affinity pairs is where uh, is where the drop in trust was bigger and uh, where it was more differential. So this finding seems to be consistent with our prediction of differential updating of trust in light of uh, negative uh, shocks. So actually, in, this is very encouraging, but we were able to replicate this result in the Euronormative data as well. So these data are a bit trickier because uh, there were no huge recessions similar to the 2008-2009 crisis during the time period of the Eurobarometer data. So Eurobarometer data was from 1970 until 1996. That was a relatively quiet time uh, in Europe. And the biggest recession that happened during the, the time span was the 1993 recession, uh, which is what we use here. So it's, it happened at the end of our uh, data. So we use the uh, recession, this recession to conduct basically the same exercise in which we try to see if trust uh, if trust in this Eurobarometer data decreased uh, uh, more in countries uh, uh, in countries with a greater GDP decline, and uh, whether this uh, decline was differential decline was differential also by the uh, measures of affinity that we have in mind. And when we uh, uh, yes, so uh, yeah, so again, why we why we do it this way is because. And the, the recession occurred at the end of our uh, time period, at the end of the data. So after 1993, there was just uh, only three years, 1994, 1995, 1996. And we know that trust is sort of in general, slow to come back. It's, it's very quick to uh, mm -hmm. drop, but it's relatively slow to come back. So that's why we believe that this specification is a bit better uh, in, this particular, in this particular case, in this particular data set. Uh, okay, so what we see here is that again in the first uh, row you can see that the uh, the decline in trust was biggest uh, in countries uh, um, where the respondents were hit with a bigger economic shock. So if GDP declined more in the country of the respondent, uh, that person uh, on average decreased uh, their trust toward other countries. 
after 1993. And uh, 1% point decline in GDP in 1993 is associated with about 50 to 65% of uh, strange deviation uh, uh, decline in that person's trust toward other countries. But then we can check whether this decline in trust was bigger towards countries that were more distant uh, to the country of the respondent. And this is exactly, this is actually what we find, for, uh, which, is, can be, which can be observed in this uh, second, third, and fourth row coefficients. So there seems to be evidence of relocation of trust during crisis away from countries with uh, less affinity toward countries with uh, more affinity. So because the previous table was a version of a difference in difference strategy, one of the main assumptions behind that strategy is, uh, is the parallel trends assumption. And it means that absent the 1993 recession, uh, trust of one nation to another would have evolved uh, along parallel trends independent of the interaction between the decline in GDP in the nation of the respondent and the measure of affinity between the two countries. So what we do here is that we estimate the same specification as, as in this table, but now instead of using this uh, post-1993 uh, indicator, we use yearly indicators instead for each survey wave. And then we normalize the indicator just before the recession to zero. And, uh, and yeah, and you can see that before the recession, uh, you know, trust between countries with low uh, high affinity pairs with high and low GDP decline in 1993 evolved along parallel trends. You may think about these estimates also as placebos, right? Because uh, the decline, GDP decline in 1993 should not matter for uh, how trust was evolving uh, in 1980 and 1986. Uh, that's sort of intuitive as well. And then this figure also allows us to inspect the dynamic uh, of the effect of the recession. So the coefficient becomes positive and significant uh, in 1993, slightly smaller in 1994, and then starts to fade away only in 1996. So again, this pattern is consistent with the idea that uh, differential negative shocks to trust are, are typically absorbed uh, slowly. This is, uh, this is uh, not a consensus in literature, but that's one of the patterns that literature uh, knows already. Okay, so I'm uh, closing on my uh, presentation. So let me tell you more about the implications of the paper and of this relationship between trust and affinity that we have, uh, that we uh, documented and uh, these uh, additional uh, predictions that we tested. So one of the clearest implications is that if the designer wants to elicit some private information, uh, which may be sensitive, uh, then matching people on affinity can potentially yield measurable benefits. Uh, so one example, suppose that you're, uh, you're a bank and you're assigning financial advisors to people, uh, to investors, then uh, because it's such a trust intensive uh, match, maybe you might want to uh, consider kind of matching them on a feed. So that's just one suggestion. Of course, it's not, it's not a normative suggestion that you should do that. It's just, you know, objectively, this might increase trust between people and might lead to kind of a be better, uh, better, uh, better uh, match. And we actually Indeed, in the literature, there is some evidence for that as well. I will not talk about that uh, right now. But in this in the survey, actually, in this in interview, interpreter survey, we actually have some evidence of that as well. So one part of the survey was to measure the size of fingers of entrepreneurs uh, to calculate the digit ratio. So I know that uh, probably many of you in the, in the Center for Institutional Studies know uh, what, what digit ratio is and, and why one would, would want to measure that. Uh, but uh, yes, it is the ratio between uh, the index finger and the uh, ring finger that is indicative of uh, testosterone. Okay, and uh, in our survey, actually, many entrepreneurs refused to do it, refused to take measurements. <laughs> Around 40% of the sample refused to do it. And uh, why? Because they were unsure why this information needed to be collected in the first place. So they were really, really skeptical. So this refusal to... Uh, uh, be subject to this uh, collection of information was actually an act, uh, an act of distrust itself. And what we found in their data is that if the interviewer happened to be uh, very close to entrepreneurs in the Finja, uh, those interviewers were much more successful at retrieving this information. So if you were designing the survey instead of randomly assigning the interviewers to entrepreneurs, you might actually want to take that into account potentially if the sole goal of yours uh, was to collect this information. 
actually, uh, you can see that you know this uh, 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 this was potentially sensitive kind of when the uh, uh, when the pairs were of different sex, uh, uh, but that was not the only uh, that was not the only thing that drove this uh, positive coefficient in, on affinity. Also, here we can uh, we can. Uh, we do find some evidence in favor of the second prediction as well when we use this more objective measure of uh, trust of distrust. We show we show that this strange deviation of the decision to uh, participate in finger measurement was actually lower uh, on affinity level. And then another application, which is potentially stretching it, but we are trying to you know, stretch uh, this, uh, this argument as much as far as possible as we can. So another implication is that since this economic crisis induce a reallocation of trust, this could also mean that uh, economic crisis may reduce a reallocation of trade away from low affinity pairs of countries to uh, low affinity pairs of countries. So that's uh, another potential implications of our, our our framework and our results. Uh, so uh, when we 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 try to find some support for that in the uh, trade data within the European Union from 2001 through 2014. So why European Union? Be just because we have these results for Eurobarometer, we would want to you know, have a mapping between uh, uh, those results and, and the results for trade. So you can see here that actually, you know, the uh, the 2008 crisis did not lead to a Major kind of fall in uh, in in trade flows. There, there was some decline, of course, but what it did is that it could, it sort of acted as a trend breaker. So there was a trend uh, in trade flows before, and then uh, it plateaued after that. Uh, uh, and so then the idea of the, of the specification would be uh, whether this relocation uh, in trade happened, uh, meaning that whether this uh, trend declined whether this trend slowed down more uh, in pairs of countries with low affinity uh, or uh, and whether it slowed down less in pairs of countries uh, with uh, higher affinity and actually, we actually find support for that uh, surprisingly to us but we do so before uh, the 2008 crisis uh, the uh, trade was growing was growing by about eight percent per year after that this uh, on average this growth was this growth went to zero Right, so that's what the second row of the coefficient say, tells you. But uh, this decline in uh, the slow down in trend uh, of growth was uh, was uh, uh, was was this slowdown was less uh, between was was lower <laughs> between countries uh, that were of high affinity to, with each other. So that's the main point of the paper. In a very restrictive uh, specification, we can actually control for also origin country year and destination country year fixed effect. That means that whatever shocks occur in these countries, in these two pairs of countries, uh, in this in these countries uh, within a pair in a given year, uh, that will be absorbed. Uh, and uh, um, of course, we cannot control for shocks to a specific pair in a year because that would be multicollinear with our specification. But what we have, what we with with this, what we want to measure uh, in affinity. But uh, when we include those uh, fixed effects, the coefficient is still there. And then importantly, um, uh, we also can split the, the sample uh, into homogeneous uh, trade pro product of homo uh, trade of homogeneous products and trade of uh, differentiated products. And you can see that this coefficient is bigger for uh, trade of differentiated products, which are typically thought of uh, as more trust intensive. In the literature. So to conclude, uh, affinity is associated not only with higher trust but also with blinded trust. Uh, we find that a dispersion of trust is lower when affinity is high. It seems to be very consistent. Uh, it seems to be a very consistent results across uh, across uh, uh, data sets, and uh, trust also seems to be slower to update during big shocks to, to, to trustworthiness, such as financial and economic crisis. And we rationalize these patterns. In the simple trust game model. So, uh, the two implications. Uh, so, this one I already mentioned. The second one I also sort of mentioned. But uh, one uh, idea that I did mention to you is that for which we do not have data. So, I would not push it too much. But uh, another idea of potential implications is that during crisis of political trust, populists tend to come, come to power. So, that's 
uh, the background. Uh, so there is a rise of populists uh, in the European Union and uh, in the Western world more generally. And uh, they sort of came uh, to power at uh, during the period in which trust uh, toward politicians was uh, the lowest uh, at the bottom. And so uh, the idea is that uh, uh, the, one implication of our results is that uh, during the big shocks to uh, trust, there was a relocation of trust away from people with low, affin uh, with low affinity toward uh, people uh, with uh, high affinity. And that might potentially explain why populists tend to be closer to voters on observance. So this new paper by Dalbo and Coffers, it actually documents that in the context of Sweden, uh, so uh, this uh, uh, right-wing populist Swedish Democrats, they were on average closer on observables, the politicians in this party were closer on observables uh, to the general population, to the voters, relative to other uh, uh, other parties, po po uh, politicians from other parties. And that may suggest that, indeed, during the crisis of uh, trust, of political trust, uh, people, uh, my, uh, people trust more people, uh, politicians uh, who match them on observables, and potentially matching on observables might be a useful strategy for politicians during this crisis of distrust. So that's that's another potential implication. Again, we are trying to stretch this as, as far as possible. So uh, we think that uh, it is uh, fitting our story very well, but uh, we don't have the data for that uh, yet. But we are we might we might work on that. All right. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me again and. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the questions and the comments. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alexei. Now the floor is open to questions and comments, please. Any questions, any clarification? Sergey, now might be a good time to get back to your yeah, question, I, if you're still I, keen to. I have a few questions. So first of all, regarding this drop in trust following uh, uh, the negative shock. Uh, so, so did you, so you, you showed us that it depends on affinity, uh, but did you control for the initial level of trust if it was possible at all? Because maybe it actually depends on the initial level of trust rather than affinity, which are correlated, of course, but yeah. Yes, so, so, so here we, uh, uh, here i don't think we cannot i don't think we can do it in this survey just because it's not a balanced panel of interviewers and entrepreneurs interviewers actually interviewers are sometimes the same but entrepreneurs are never the same so it's sort of a weird uh, this weird panel so we cannot do that in this context but we do that for example in this context because we can include this country pair fixed effect which okay. basically controls for any uh variable that is sort of uh, um, uh, unchanged uh, through the course uh, throughout throughout the time period. That means that potentially, if you have some average level of trust, that will sort of be taken out uh, by this uh, uh, by this country peer peer fix rate. So, so that should address to some extent your concern. Um, then uh, this the second question uh, is: uh, Can you uh, say uh, anything about uh, which dimensions of affinity matter more? For trust, because you showed us a, a, correla a kind of correlation table of various, uh, you know, components uh, of affinity with uh, with the measure of affinity. But you know, which of those matter more for trust? Can we say something about this? Uh, yeah. So that's a good Maybe question. The answer is good question. Everything, uh, you know, <laughs> for example. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. So in this table, uh, so the issue is that uh, uh, because these measures are not a super good predictors of affinity on their own, uh, we cannot really use them as IVs, standalone IVs uh, in the regression of affinity and trust. So that sort of prevents us from really learning uh, more about that. We can potentially Instead of regressing affinity on these, we can potentially see if uh, what what happens when we regress trust on these uh, individually. So we can do that. Uh, we haven't done this. Um, and then um, in the barometer data, there is some sense in which. Oh, sorry, so I'm, I'm jumping between uh, slides. But uh, in the, there is some because these indices are actually standardized. There is some sense in which actually genetic similarity uh, 
is associated one standard deviation uh, increase in genetic similarity is associated with a bigger increase in trust uh, relative to one standard deviation increase in religious similarity. But that's that's the only thing that we can say <laughs> in the moment. So I, I'm not sure to what extent that's really you know uh, satisfying to you. But uh, but yeah, we'll think about that. Uh, I think that's a good question. All right. <clears throat> Thanks. Please, more questions, more comments. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, if I may. Please go ahead. Man, good to see you. Oh, hi, Peyo. <laughs> nice to see you too. Yeah, so, so, so I don't know. I mean, uh, I thought something came to mind when Sergei was asking this, but I don't know if it makes much sense. But could you make a maybe more sexy theoretical story by thinking that the affinity is more related to a reduction of? Ambiguity. On on what? Can you repeat that, please? Reduction, uh, of, reduction of ambiguity. All right, ambiguity. Okay. You know, the more similar you are to someone, the less ambiguous your uncertainty about whatever about them is. Okay. Because yeah, no, it's. Uh... Then, then, for example, like in the table you saw now, some of the aspects would kind of seem to fit like little uncertainty about people from the same region, little uncertainty about people, uh, I don't know which other thing, how many stars, but like eye colors wouldn't matter, like for how much uncertainty you have about some, how someone is going to behave. Uh, yeah, to some extent, yeah, of course, yeah, I need to, I need to uh, you know, I need to think about this more. Uh, my intuition is that intuitively what we have in mind is sort of similar. So what we have in mind is just that, uh, yeah, it's just that affinity gives you a high prior on uh, trust. So that means that uh, because you would, you would rely on more on noisy signals uh, if you don't have high affinity, then you have a lot of dispersion in trust beliefs. So, so in that, in some sense, kind of empirically maybe the stories are similar in the sense that you have less uncertainty about uh, how the person behaves as trust is if if is low. So it, I just, but I understand that sort of uh, mechanically in, in theory, uh, theoretically it would be different. So, but yeah, I'll think about that. Uh, that's a, the, yeah. M maybe I can send you uh, the paper and <laughs> we can yeah. think about this together <laughs> as well. <laughs> uh, nice to meet all right, thanks, Pia. Anyone else, please? Uh, yeah, uh, let me, yeah. well, one more question uh, about, um, you had this uh, matching on affinities, almost like a policy implication on one of your last slides. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, um, on the one hand, it's kind of dangerous because- I of, know, yeah. Of, yeah, I mean, I mean, because there are many dimensions to this. So on the one, first of all, on the one hand, there there should be self-selection actually. So you don't really need to impose it, I guess, if just people right. who are more similar to each other trust uh, more each other uh, in in crisis, they would just you know self-select in in uh, in groups or in pairs. So you don't really need to impose. But then it prevents like uh, intergroup uh, you know relationships, which might which might also be uh, productive and beneficial socially beneficial so i mean i wouldn't go that far as to say that uh, you know matching on affinity is, is good so, uh, yeah no it's just it's good in the very narrow sense yeah which exactly. if, as a designer you might i mean as a designer of the story you might want to you know maximize this uh, collection of this particular information this particular survey in that sense matching affinity is helpful it's just uh, it's 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 helpful in this narrow sense. Of course, I understand that there are some ethical considerations for sure, and uh, and also in some situations, of course, not not everywhere. Uh, but also, uh, yeah, it could be that yeah, potentially in the real world where there is no sort of designer which uh, allocates people, maybe we don't even need to do that just because uh, there is some natural self selection. Yeah. Very good, thanks. Uh, Alexei, I haven't seen your model and I 
it's probably a good idea to have a look at it. Right. But the questions that I have are actually similar to what Sergey asked. And uh, let me start with a with a joke. It's an anecdote, I guess, of some sort. Uh, a Jew arrives on a business trip to a, to a town where he doesn't know anyone. He has quite a bit of cash on him, so he feels insecure about the money. Thought about the best place to keep the money while he's on that trip, and because he didn't, didn't know anyone, he decided best person to trust the money would be the rabbi. So he visits the rabbi and asks the rabbi to keep the money while he's on the trip. And the rabbi says, of course, yeah, I'll do it. But uh, do you really trust me? He said, of course. But he said, just to be on the safe side, let's have a couple of witnesses who will see that you give me the money. So you have the security. So they call witnesses randomly chosen. Uh, so uh, the visitor takes care of his business. And then uh, it's time for him to go back. He visits the rabbi once again. <laughs> And he's treated very well, served the dinner, whatnot, but there is no indication the rabbi is going to give him back the money. And very reluctantly, he asks about the money. And the rabbi says, what money? And he says, well, rabbi, I just gave you a bit of money. I'd like to get it back. He said, no, you didn't give me anything. But we have witnesses. Well, you know, you're, it's, a, it's a bad joke. Uh, sir, but of course, call the witnesses. So witnesses came and the rabbi says, that guy tells me that he gave me some stupid money. Of course, it's a complete nonsense, but did you see any of that? Witnesses said, of course not, Rabbi, he, he must be crazy. <laughs> so witnesses departed and uh, the rabbi gives back the money to the, to the guy. And the guy is shaking and he asked the rabbi, Rabbi, why such a cruel joke? He said, no, I just want to give an idea about what kind of people I have to deal with. So uh, the purpose of the joke is that uh, you argue that uh, if someone is like myself, I would trust that person more. And that is not altogether clear to me because uh, my priors about myself might not be very high. You know what I mean? <laughs> so there are, uh, if I know that I belong to a group uh, uh, where people are likely to cheat, and if I see someone else uh, belonging to the same group, that all else equal would be a reason for me to trust that person less. And that will still make my need for additional information lower than otherwise because they know quite a bit about this person but the priors might not be necessarily that favorable and here come uh two other rationale that you mentioned the first one is <clears throat> the reputational concern i trust a second person who is close to my to myself because of the affinity more because uh, i value my reputation that person's eyes quite a bit more but affinity alone would not necessarily generate this effect and the second one is that perhaps my moral cost of cheating on a person who is like myself might be quite a bit higher. You know, my anguish about doing something bad to someone who is close to myself. And, and that, that's something similar to what uh, Jean-Philippe Plateau called general morality or limited morality and whatnot. You have to behave morally <clears throat> to people who are close to you. So you might want to use some of these arguments. But you know, speaking empirically, if there is a chance to control for the group to which a person who is about to trust and not to trust belongs herself, that might give you some uh, additional results and uh, might not necessarily be the case that if someone is from a low trust group, uh, then uh, that person would exhibit greater trust to someone else who belongs to the same group, I think. <clears throat> the main idea of your paper is that uh, Affinity gives you some priors is a very good one, and I like it a great deal. But whether these priors are necessarily positive or possibly negative, depending on the person, uh, is another matter. And in your data, I don't, I don't think you can test this in your data because we don't know much about in the first data set about to which group a person be belongs, but perhaps some regional variations of trust, okay? <laughs> if in some region someone has uh, the, the level of trust, the level of honesty, and for that matter, trustworthiness uh, is lower than if a Sicilian meets a Sicilian. That's what I mean. Uh, uh, bearing the fact that they might belong to the same family, in which case, of course, there will be a great deal of trust. But if they do not belong to the same trend family, if they are subject to this amoral familyism, uh, would that uh, make this person to trust another Sicilian greater? Uh, as opposed to someone who is from Milan or Venice or Florence. Or, uh, 
I would I would think about this. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. So. So definitely, uh, this uh, it came it came before uh, also that uh, in principle uh, this pattern of decline in dispersion is not necessarily uh, doesn't really need this increase in average trust. So in principle, as you as you say, in principle, right. uh, <coughs> you may even imagine like a decline in average trust. And dispersion is lower because you so know the decline in variation should be a stable effect, but the increase in trust that might not necessarily yeah. be once you control this variable. That, that's fair. That's, that's fair. Uh, so that, I that's guess. Good point. Yeah, my I guess my rebuttal, uh, one potential rebuttal to that would be just that this increase in trust in average trust by affinity seems to be a very robust uh, empirical fact. So mm -hmm. uh, it it is true that. Uh, Theoretically, you can imagine uh, even a decline in average trust uh, if if you know that the group is is not very if if you, if you do not trust yourself as you said <laughs> so kind okay. of in the limit yes. in the limit right. uh, in the limit it, it sort of matters how much you trust yourself uh, in in this particular story because mm -hmm. you 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 are one hundred percent close to observables on yourself <laughs> to yourself that's for sure, sure. so. Right. Uh, um, but it's empirically, this seems to be a, this this increase seems to be a very robust uh, result, both in the previous literature as I mentioned, but also in our data sets. So this literature, it's not it's just a subset of the uh, uh, papers that we cite. Actually, uh, uh, there are quite a few more uh, that uh, that's in the sort of in the same line that suggest the same thing uh, for other dimensions of Fiji. So that's our uh, rebuttal to that, and then. Uh, the theoretical framework that we have is is very simple. So I, I actually I didn't show you just because uh, potentially uh, uh, you know it's it it sort of intuitively falls out of this assumption. I, I can show it to you right now if you if, if you want. But the, well, uh, that framework is based sort of on these two uh, empirical facts in this particular data set that average trust goes up, goes up and, and dispersion goes down. So we wanted to match those predictions and see uh, what falls as a, as, a, as a different prediction. So that's that was our our motivation. So I don't know to what extent I'm answering the question very well. But no, no, well, I, you, yeah, uh, I understand. Uh, <clears throat> maybe I should clarify. It's not so much about how much I trust myself. It's more about what I know about the group to which I belong. I have some prior knowledge about that group. I might be an exception. I might be, you know, a person of very high moral standard. But uh, people who are similar to me should not be trusted. And if I see someone who actually is trusted, uh, who who belongs to the same group, that will make my priors rather negative than positive. And if you are able to control for <clears throat> for trustworthiness <clears throat> of of the group to which someone belongs and use the interaction of this trust, trust worsens with affinity and then you might have yeah. a, a significant effect which which could be useful okay well, no, i thanks. think uh, yeah i think this is a good uh, suggestion yeah so uh i think uh there is some difference in the way we think about this uh, problem maybe uh i think the way because the way we think about these assumptions sort of behavioral uh, it's not really about the affinity is not really a containing it's containing information about the costs of for the counterpart to cheat on you but it's okay. not really containing right. uh, it's not really containing information of whether this uh, uh, affinity class is trustworthy in a sense um, so that's <coughs> might be <laughs> might be a reason why there's this um, difference in predictions potentially that arises uh, in this framework relative to what you have in mind very good, <clears throat> fair enough, thanks. Good stuff. Please, anyone else uh, to so raise If we have time, I can show you the model. <laughs> make comments. <clears throat> well, uh, yeah, uh, we, we still have a little bit of time. So yeah, sure, I, uh, might, be, might be a useful thing. Yeah. Okay, so let, uh, let's see. So, so okay, so let me uh, tell oh, you about the, the setup. Model, right. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. 
I'll, I'll be even writing. So yeah, so here you have uh, two n individuals. They are randomly pair. They are randomly paired with another individual. So there are n pairs. So then uh, timing is as follows. So individuals discover their affinity. They feel toward the counterpart. Affinity is actually symmetric in our model, and, and there is some evidence suggests in our data that it's true in the data as well. So, uh, so they discover this affinity level, and then uh, each individual receives a signal about the reliability of the other part. So after that, and then uh, after that, uh, there is um, there is an opportunity for this trust game in which one person becomes a second mover and the first one, uh, and and the other one is the first mover in the trust game. So. Um, Trust game is uh, very simple. So uh, first, you have this uh, uh, first individual who uh, chooses whether to uh, trust, so this trust or not trust. Okay. Um, so if, of course, this person does not trust, then um, this person gets to keep the money, just a tiny bit of money, uh, and there is no uh, payoff for the second person. Uh, and then the first, the second person can choose either to predate. Well, not predate. So, so if uh, this second uh, person chooses to predate, and then uh, this person just basically steals the money. Uh, uh, however, there is some cost to that. So the first cost is what we call reliability. So if the person is reliable, then it's costlier for this person to cheat. And the second part is separate from that is affinity. So we we think that. Uh, there is some psychological cost involved in right. cheating on the person if if you're very similar to each other. And then, uh, and then of course, if you don't predate, then uh, there is a positive, there is a mutual beneficial exchange. Um, they sort of an investment opportunity that yields benefits to both parties. Of course, uh, just a standard assumption. So uh, it's nice that uh, uh, this thing is bigger than epsilon just because otherwise there would be no incentives for um, the person to ev even invest for the first person to invest. So then of course the uh, for the second person uh, it should be that uh, this thing is bigger than this thing uh, just because otherwise uh, they would uh, they would not predate any, uh, at all uh, in, in any case. And then we make this assumption that A is from zero to one, R is from zero to one. Uh, and then this reliability is drawn from this distribution with the posterior distribution GS, uh, G that depends on the signal. And then trust, what, what is trust in this model is just uh, the probability with which, uh, with which the person is not, is not going to cheat on you. <laughs> so, so, that's, okay. uh, uh, so that's the def definition <laughs> that, we have, that we have here. So given the signal that uh, this first person receives, um, what is the probability, uh, what is the posterior probability that on R, uh, it comes from R such that uh, the second person does not cheat on you. And then from that, uh, oh yeah, finally, the final assumptions, just a, a, a very sort of rough model. Um, uh, but uh, here what we, because we want to, sort of approximate what we have in the data, we assume this fixed uh, uh, set of uh, realized classes of affinity. So this is affinity. So um, we want to approximate this kind of discrete nature of the data. So, uh, so there are this M classes of affinity that contains uh, the same number of pairs. So we don't want any heterogeneity. We want to shut it down in the number of pairs by affinity. And then uh, also the same thing calls for the reliability levels. And then also importantly, this realized sets of signals is identical across affinity classes. So in this affinity class, uh, uh, there are the whole set of signals is present. And then in this affinity class, the whole set of signals is also present. So just to shut down some things that we don't want to happen. Then from that, we get this proposition number one, which is, means that the average level of trust in pairs with affinity level A is greater than the average level of trust in affinity in pairs with affinity level A prime when A is bigger than A prime. And it just falls from, from this de definition of trust. Uh, so uh, if A is bigger than, oh, sorry. Yeah, 
Anyway, it, yeah, I messed up with the right. No, that, the, that yeah, but it's clear. That, is clear, it's, clear right? that it should, should, it's quite should intuitive. Use. Yeah. Then uh, the second uh, proposition that we uh, we get from this additional assumption uh, for that we need this additional assumption is that uh, at the even at the lowest level of affinity, there is at least one signal that enables the this pair to achieve full trust. And uh, our motivation for the assumption is first just the data. So in this data set, uh, if you remember, uh, uh, the uh, this was trust, this was affinity. So even for the lowest level of affinity, there was there were some pairs for whom trust was the highest. So uh, so from that we think that this assumption makes sense. And then for each level of affinity, there were some pairs for whom trust was highest. Uh, also, you may think about this assumption just uh, that there might exist some hard information that you know, definitely makes you trust the person, even if you don't like the person. So from that assumption, you get this form of proposition. So suppose it holds, then the dispersion in uh, then you if you define the dispersion as a range between the minimum and the maximum or levels of trust for a given level of affinity, then the dispersion of trust in the pairs uh, or, or, uh, with affinity level A that is smaller uh, is smaller than the affinity that the dispersion of trust in pairs with affinity level uh, A prime when A is bigger than A prime. So and this is again. Uh, uh, it sort of falls from uh, from this uh, previous uh, proof that I just showed you. Uh, it just you apply it to the minimum uh, of uh, the uh, trust beliefs, and you know that uh, minimum of the trust beliefs uh, should increase for each level of affinity, and the the top, the maximum stays the same. So the range is decreasing. So, okay. And then and then uh, there are the uh, other propositions. Uh, <coughs> Uh, the first one is that if you have, uh, if, you, if you introduce this opportunity for a person to uh, observe fully the reliability of a, of a partner at a certain cost, uh, then uh, there, there will be some thresholds of affinity above which and be, above which the person will not uh, obtain the signal, and below that, below which the person will obtain the signal, and this uh, threshold of affinity will uh, ch would change depend on the uh, on the cost, and then. Uh, and then there is this fourth proposition is sort of similar. It, uh, it, yeah. yeah, it says that uh, just it derives the signal value and it shows that the signal value is um, is zero above certain threshold of affinity, but uh, but then it's it's uh, it's decreasing. Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's I think it it, re it reaches zero at some point. It decreases with affinity above this threshold, but below this threshold, it's actually increasing. So I think that's the idea. Okay, well, thanks very much. So the main, um, the main logic, the main idea is that uh, affinity increases trust because it raises the cost of cheating on exactly. a person if it belongs exactly. to the same group. And that's mm -hmm. fair enough. But again, I would keep in mind that there might be a counteracting effect, which uh, is uh, the knowledge about the group to someone belongs. And uh, if right. this knowledge is positive, then this effect in fact would reinforce uh, the moral uh, rationales, but if it's negative, it would op work in the opposite direction. And that might be some kind of a sorting factor. It's another source of exogenous variations that is probably testable somehow. Yeah. Thanks very much, Alexei. Uh, let's yeah, see. thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't see any other questions. I see a few thank you comments, which I gladly share. <laughs> Thanks very much, Alexei, for presenting this work. We look forward to hopefully seeing you again at the seminar. Good luck with your work. And uh, Bernardo, could you please usually uh, yes, uh, tell us what's well, coming uh, up next? Yeah, well, thank you, Alexei, for presenting for us. It was a pleasure to, to have you online. And uh, well, so next week we have, a, actually, we will have for the first time, at least during my time as uh, organizer, we will have like uh, two speakers. So uh, yeah. Mike, uh, Michael Clement and Thomas Gin, they are going to present their paper about uh, global mobility and threat of pandemics, evidence from three centers. So that's next Thursday at uh, the same time. So, and 